Good evening. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Amira, and I serve on the, <laughs> on the Connections team. And our teaching text today comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Dostoevsky says this, love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. When you think about joining a church, whenever you think about loving relationships, you probably think about this. It's like, look at that. Oh, kinfolky, you know, I mean, kinfolky meets Brooklyn. And in your heart, you probably dream of a diverse, loving group of people with exotic musical instruments where you get to basically hum in tongues in unity. It's just an incredible environment. It's beautiful. Next slide. Um, also, just creative ways of showing love. Do you know what I mean? Like a little shared art project there. It's beautiful. What you don't know is that that is the blood from your heart as community has destroyed, killed you, and uh, brought up every horrible thing in your life and made you disillusioned and want to leave the church. Amazing. Beautiful. I didn't know if that was going to work, and it hasn't worked all day. <laughs> the idea of church is amazing. Christians are challenging. The idea of love is it, it stirs you. Practicing love costs you. Love is hard, really hard, increasingly hard, maybe impossibly hard in the world we live in right now. Here's, here's the full context of that Dostoevsky quote. Listen to what he says. Love in action is, harsh, is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. Love in dreams is greedy for immediate action, rapidly performed and in the sight of all. Men will give their lives if only the ordeal does not last long but is soon over, with all looking on and applauding as though on a stage. But active love is labor and fortitude, and for some people too, perhaps a complete science. And so today's talk is part two of a talk I started last week. Uh, in the series on Philippians. Last week, after talking about the gospel and what it means to have Christ as the center of everything, and after Paul is talking to the Philippians about the beauty of what God has done in their midst, he turns the corner in chapter 2 because they're experiencing conflict in their church. And so you remember last week he started by saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. He talked about looking not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And we talked about vain glory, that glory deficit, because you're made in the image of God, but sin has robbed you of that existential sense of worth. And how New York is a city where people are doing everything they can to fill that glory deficit. Last week was an exhortation. This week, Paul continues the same section of Scripture with an illustration of how it is that Jesus loves us. And so here's my goal for you tonight. Everybody, will you listen, listen in very carefully? My goal for you tonight is to help you to learn to love like Jesus. Your faith is only as good as your love. So it doesn't matter how, how many podcasts you listen to. It doesn't matter how much you serve the poor. It doesn't matter how much you're, you're doing things for God. You're in the prayer room grinding. All of that, Paul says, if you don't have love, it's all noise. 
So we've got to get good at love. We've got to get good at it. So that's what I want to talk tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about how this is manifest through the life of Jesus. So let's jump in. If Number one, we have to think about relationships like Jesus did if we're going to love like Jesus. Here's what I mean. You've got a mentality. You've got expectations. You have a mindset about what relationships are for, as a follower of Jesus. But do we have Jesus' mindset? about how to do relationships. Look at what verse 5 says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. If Jesus himself walked into church tonight, what would he be thinking about the people who are here? And as he's moving towards people, what would Jesus' mindset be about gathering as God's people? Well, two things we see that sort of dominate Jesus' mentality around relationships when he was on earth. Number one is that Jesus came as a servant. Servanthood, serving people, was central to his mentality. He was a giver, not a taker. I, I, I mean, Jesus has done so many things that, that honestly amaze me. This past week, I've been so struck reading the Gospels. I've had to put my iPad down for moments at a time, just sat there weeping, going, who is this man? Who is this man that teaches this and loves like this and acts like this? This is not how people do it. Where is this man coming from? Where does he get these teachings? But the thing that blows me the mo- blows my mind the most about Jesus, you know what it is? His patience with his disciples who do not get it. That's the thing. Like, there's hope for me. Jesus was patient with his actual disciples. They were obsessed with being great. So the amount of times that they're they're having a little chat, you see they're walking along the road. Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. And it says a dispute arose amongst them as to which one was to be considered the greatest. And there's another moment where Jesus is at uh, what we call the communion table, the Last Supper. He's washed their feet. This is in Luke's Gospel. He's washed their feet. And it says a dispute arose amongst them as to which one was to be considered the greatest. You can imagine that's like, hey, I don't know how to tell you this. Jesus washed my feet first, man. So like, I think I'm the greatest. And someone's like, yeah, he did you first because he feels bad for you. The first shall be last. I was last. It was a test. You just, and, then, and the whole time Jesus is like, I'm washing you. You're missing the point of the exercise here. He's literally saying, this is my body broken for you. And they're like, I appreciate that. By the way, which one of us do you perceive to be the greatest? In this account, a couple of the disciples get their mum in on the act. And so their mum's like, excuse me, Jesus, I'd like to have a word with you if I can. He's like, yes, how may I help you? Is it about greatness? Actually, now that you've brought that up, one of the things I did want to know, is it possible if I could get my boys on your light, right and left as you're heading into the kingdom of heaven? And then here's Jesus' response, okay? When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, like, you're bringing your mom into it. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you, he's like, you want to be great? You got greatness? Here's what you do. You must be the servant of everybody. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus' attitude repeatedly is, and he says this, I am among you as one who serves. The more mature you become, the more you will want to serve other people. Christ-likeness is conformity to the image of servanthood. St. Teresa of Avila says this, when one reaches the highest degree of human maturity, one has only one question left. How can I be helpful? Honestly, isn't it an, it's an, it's, it's just in human family dynamics. The two-year-old wants what the two-year-old wants. The teenager wants what the adult, uh, the teenager wants what the teenager wants. The adult walks up and says, what does the family need? What does the family need? It is the mature person who can say, how can I help you? What do you need here? 
And this is what Jesus is doing, this attitude of servanthood. But no, it's not just servanthood. It's sacrificial servanthood. It's paying of the price. Everybody loves the idea of love. Nobody wants to pay the price to love. It costs. It costs us something. And so our invitation, like Christ, is sacrificing. This is the essence of the cross. He says, whoever doesn't take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So we have to see it's about sacrifice. Part of the, the challenge that, of the time of history we live in, it's, it's, honestly, it's, it's not as much as it's your fault, as much as it's just the culture at large, is that we're so caught up within ourselves that we just take whatever good is out there and apply it to self-benefit. So even spiritual disciplines, which are designed to make you into a servant, we take and serve ourselves with them. It's like, I can't serve right now. Why? I'm in a, I'm in a, I need a sabbatical. I'm like, you're 18. You haven't done anything yet. You don't need a sabbatical. You need to work. There's, there's just this, this paradigm that it shouldn't cost us anything. But it does. It does. Andy Crouch has this thing, which I, the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, this is, this is the best thing. He talks about game theory, which is basically just trying to just figure out the dynamics of how to, get so, how to get ahead socially. Sometimes it's applied to business, but he said, most game theory has a, a starting dynamic we're all familiar with, win-lose. It's like, I win, you lose, or I lose, you win. But he says, we're, like, we're so aware of the relationships globally are, we are because of technology, social media, those sorts of things, that that doesn't feel ethical at all anymore. So a lot of people say, is there a way to structure our lives where it's win-win? He says, if you're really honest, win-win is like win-win for the moment while we don't touch the systems or structures that create the need for win-win in the first place. It's win-win Starbucks uh, philanthropy without changing how much you pay employees. It's, do you see what I'm saying here? It's like it's surface win-win, but it's really win-win in public, but really win-lose because I'm not going to give up anything. But he says, here's what the gospel is. I sacrifice, we win. That's the posture of Christians in the world, which is going to cost me something to make it right, and both of us will win. You'll win because you're raised up, and I'll win because my pride is torn down and love is activated. What a beautiful vision. This is Jesus' heart. It's to th- and this, is, this is what Paul says. When you are with other Christians and you're doing life, When you're sitting at the table, it says you should think about people the way Jesus thinks about people, which is how can I pay the price for their flourishing and how can I serve them instead of serving myself? So the first thing, we have to think about our relationships the way Jesus thinks about relationships. Number two, we have to act out in love what we think about love. So that that means we have to take the things that we believe and we have to apply them in our world. Look again at this teaching text. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, I want to tell you right now, that little section of Scripture that I just read, that's top two Scriptures in the whole Bible right there. We're so familiar with it. I'm telling you, atheists have been converted by that passage. Cults have been started because of this passage. People have left their faith because of this passage. This this is a loaded text. Because in essence, it's asking, how great is Jesus and how far did he descend for us? It's a foundational question. So this is what this passage teaches. First thing it teaches us is that how Jesus went about serving and sacrificing was by emptying himself of his privilege and divine prerogatives for us. This idea in the Greek, it's kenosis, it literally means to empty. And theologians believe Jesus didn't empty himself of his divinity, but he consciously chose not to rely on the divine attributes all the time in his life. So that means that he was limited to having a human nature and a divine nature. It means Jesus got hungry. 
Jesus got lonely. Jesus felt what we feel. He's subjected. This is the author writing himself into the story and then dealing with the consequences of the characters he created in the story. This is amazing. This is the wonder of the incarnation. This is how Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, one of the church fathers said it. He said, now, did God send his son as a human, might assume, to rule by tyranny, fear, and terror? Far from it. He sent him out of kindness and gentleness, like a king sending his son, who was himself a king. He sent him as God. He sent him as man to man. He willed to save men by persuasion, not by compulsion, for compulsion is not God's way of working. So here comes Jesus. He empties himself. Jesus is in heaven receiving glory, honor, majesty, attention, and he drops into the womb of a woman and is born into a tiny neighborhood on the edge of the empire and lives for 30 years, and people hardly even notice that God is in the neighborhood. What a miracle. This past week, or I had a very long week, so recently, I'm going to reframe that, recently, uh, the Webb Telescope produced some images of uh, the universe. Let's pop that up. Do you see this? Some great memes, by the way. This, uh, if you were awake to this technology, you sat there dumbfounded at how small your little life is. How vast the universe is. The hundred billion stars in our universe. Oh, sorry, in our galaxy. And I think there's a hundred billion galaxies. How are you doing? We're tiny. Here's what Paul Reese says. Look at him. This amazing Jesus. He's helping Joseph make a yoke in that little carpenter shop in Nazareth. This is the one who, apart from his self-emptying, emptying, could far more easily make a solar system or a galaxy of systems. The humility of Jesus to empty himself out. Earlier this year, I read Walter Isaacson's um, book on Albert Einstein. I loved it. I binged it. I couldn't put it down. And uh, Einstein is such a character. I mean, just a wild guy. And, um, you know, you know, reasonably intelligent. And uh, just changed the way we view, I don't know, reality. And uh, so people wanted to be around him. And he had all these uh, people would travel from all over the world to do these working sessions with him. He's surrounded by Nobel Prize winners and all the rest of it. But when people in New Jersey found out where he lived, like they'd come over and like school kids would come over and say, excuse me, I need help with my homework. Is Mr. Einstein in? So you've got like fourth graders bringing in math problems to Einstein. And to the absolute consternation of everybody in the room, he'd say, excuse me, I need to take this. And he'd leave these Nobel Prize winners figuring out like deep, deep theory. And he'd go sit at a table and help this little girl with a math problem. And then people would be like, what's he doing? And he'd solve the math problem reasonably quickly and would just be playing, playing. And they would, they would leave the room and they'd just say, like, what, what, are you, what are you even doing playing with a child? And he'd say things like, imagination is more important than knowledge. Just like these amazing things. But here's my point. People were like, how can he condescend this brilliant person to fix this problem? Listen, that is nothing compared to the maker of the galaxies of the universe sitting at the table of your life dealing with your problems. This is God coming to you. I'm lonely, Lord, and he shows up at the table to tend to your heart. I need community, Lord, and then he gives you a, a half-decent roommate, bless God. <laughs> this is the kindness of God. He emptied himself out. That means that in our lives, we've got to empty ourselves out for other people. You can't be full of the Holy Spirit and full of the love of God if you're full of yourself. Romans 15, that's good, that was harsh, <laughs> but I meant it with love. Romans 15, 3, listen to this, this, these passages, if, if they would become the, uh, the way we lived in the world. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Listen, read that out loud with me, would you? 
for even Christ did not please himself. Well, it must be easy being Jesus. For even Christ did not please himself. That's what Thomas Merton says. Love is not a matter of getting what you want, quite the contrary. The insistence on always having what you want, on always being satisfied, on always being fulfilled, makes love impossible. So that that means that we have to be in rooms because this is the way Jesus acted. We're gonna empty ourselves of what it is that we want and we need to ask, what do you need? What are some of your preferences? How can you flourish? I'm good, what do you need? What a beautiful attitude. We've gotta empty ourselves of entitlement. And then we see that Jesus is humbling himself He's emptying himself of the need to get his own needs met. This to me is extraordinary. It says that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's a very strong word in the Greek. It means to seize or to carry off by force, almost to abduct. It says he did not consider the need to cling on, to hold on, to seize, being equal with God, but he humbled himself. There's no grasping for him. And isn't this true in the ministry of Jesus? Jesus is fasting for 40 days to overcome temptation. And Satan says, look, if uh, you're really the son of God, turn this into bread. Jesus goes hungry for us. But when he sees people in need, immediately he gives them bread that they need. Denies himself, feeds the multitudes. This is the whole life of Jesus. Jesus is in the garden praying, and they're like, Lord, do you want us to sort of help you out? And he says, no, 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 no. I can just talk to my father, and he would just unleash a multitude of angels. So I don't need to protect myself, but what I'm going to pray is that you are protected. I'm going to go die on the cross for your sins. This is the whole life of Jesus. He is restraining himself, humbling himself to empower other people and to give to other people. It says he made himself nothing. How about that? Why'd you come to New York? Oh, I'm in the process of making myself nothing. And I, know, I said, no, I didn't ask what New York's doing to your ego. I asked, why did you come here? These are very different questions. No one comes here to live in obscurity and insignificance. I'm really thinking about just putting five hard years in and leaving without making it. That's nobody's plan. That is, I'm cutting too close to home tonight. He said he became a bondservant. So he takes on the nature of a servant, but it's a bondservant. Very, very particular idea in the Greek. Bondservants owed nothing and were completely dependent on their masters. Jesus owned no house or land, no wealth, had to be funded by women, no boat, had to borrow his disciples' boat so we could teach, no horse, had to borrow a donkey, no room, had to borrow a room in order to do the Passover. And when he's dead, he doesn't even have his own tomb. He has to borrow a tomb to be buried in. Complete and utter humility. This is just extraordinary to me. The opposite direction of New York City. And ultimately what happens is he dies on a cross. Now, you know, there's a lot of controversy around public executions right now. Issues of justice and innocence. And also the means by which we put people to death. Lethal injection. Talking about bringing back the firing squad. Why? Because it's inhumane how we kill people. Yet here is Jesus dying the most inhumane, violent, public, humiliating death in the world. And so what does Jesus get for his servanthood and his sacrifice? Stripped naked, beaten, despised, his friends betray him and abandon him, and he is hung up and mocked by the soldiers and by the religious leaders. What a life. Who is this man? This is the beauty of Jesus' life. And then Jesus has the audacity to say this, ready? A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, servanthood, sacrifice, emptying, bondservant, public execution, as I have loved you, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So, number one, in order to get love right, to get good at loving people, you've got to think about relationships the way Jesus did. 
Number two, you have to live in your relationships and do what Jesus did. Now, at this point, uh, you're probably like, I can't do that. <laughs> can't do that. Not very good at that. I tried that and I got kicked out of my group. I'm not very, I'm not very good at that. How many of you are not good at loving like this? Anybody else? How many of you are riddled with pride because you're like, I'm gonna bl- I love everybody like this. I love everybody like this. Look, here's the truth. <laughs> I, I want to ask a different question tonight. Here's what it is, okay? So we're called to think like Jesus. We're called to do what Jesus did. Here's what I want to ask. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus do this? His disciples couldn't do this. They're like, if, we'll, we'll die for you. And they're like, later, I mean, they're like, just like that. Shift of circumstances, they're out. How did Jesus sustain this servanthood and sacrifice? Because you're not going to be able to do it and I'm not going to be able to do it. But here's the thing. If we can learn how we did it, then we can do it too. So very, very simple. How did Jesus sustain this? Number one, connection to the Father. I touched on this last week. I want to, I want to double click on it. I want to go deeper now. Jesus' first words, I must be about my Father's business. The Sermon on the Mount, he speaks of the Father 17 times. In the final discourse of the disciples, the Paschal Discourse found in John 14 through 16, the word Father is found no less than 45 times. In the next chapter, John 17, he mentions Father six more times. And at the end of his life, his final words are, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What? It's almost like Jesus is obsessed with the Father. It's almost like the Father is the reference point regardless of his situations that gives him fuel, perspective, and power to handle whatever comes his way. Listen, let me, let me put it to you like this. Satan has one great goal for your life. It's not for you to deconstruct your faith or get in some bad relationship and, you know, like de- deny your ethical vision. It's not for you to slowly drift and join a cult. It's none of those things. He has one plan, and here's what it is, to sever your connection to the Father. Because if you're just on your own trying to do you, you will, go, you will fall quickly. And that's why the most important thing is being connected to the Father. The more intense Jesus' life got, the more he withdrew from others to be with the Father to get power to handle what was happening. Learning to abide is the secret of life. How's your abiding going? That's it. There's really no other question. We must be black belts in abiding in Jesus' love. Remember, here's what Jesus said from John 15. Remain in my love. He never said remain in your feelings, remain in the last book you read, remain in how happy you are with your current church, remain in, he didn't say, he said remain in my love. He didn't say your love because your love is fickle, it's up and down, it's seasonal, his love is constant. And so it's like the great goal of life is to align yourself, to connect yourself with this living water flowing into your heart. It is that that gives us security to be able to serve. I mentioned this again, um, and I'm sorry, I only did it at the four o'clock. I didn't do it any of the other three services. So you're the only ones getting a double dose. You know what that means? Holy Spirit's pressing this on you, okay? John 13, where it says, knowing that he had come from the Father, was returning to the Father, and the Father had put all things under his feet, Jesus took off his outer garment and washed his disciples' feet. Security leads to servanthood. I love this from Blaise Pascal, talking about the internal weight that saints have in their connection with God. He says, saints have their power, their brilliance, their victory, their attraction, and have no need of carnal or intellectual greatness where these, have, where these have no place, since they neither add nor subtract anything. They are recognized by God and the angels and not by bodies or curious minds. God is enough for them. And wasn't this the power of Mother Teresa? She's, she's a saint. It's like you could put her at, like you could put her over somewhere in the Upper East Side, put her in the Argyle and give her a sweet little you know, piano bar. And, and you know what she'd say? Thanks. It means nothing. And you could drop her in a homeless shoulder and she'd say, this, this doesn't take anything away from me. You couldn't add or subtract because she was complete in the love of God. So you can't add anything to a saint who knows who they are and knows whose they are. They're good. And so there's just something so beautiful about that. Eugene Peterson, uh, in his, uh, at the end of his life, he, I love this phrase. I've been praying it. But now I've blown it. I shouldn't have said it. Anyway, he has this, he has this phrase. And he said, Lord, I want to be a saint. I just don't want anyone to know. I 
want to be a secret saint. That's amazing. Lord, I want to be a saint. That was the great goal of his life. Walter Brueggemann says this, those who sign on and depart from the system of anxious scarcity become the history makers in the neighborhood. There's a system driving our world and there's a, a system of anxious scarcity. There's not enough spots. It's like, why are people on Tinder or Hinge? It's like, why? Because why? there's not enough good people. Like, I've got to find it. Like, the search is on. Why? Scarcity. There may actually be a scarcity crisis. So I'm going to shift. I'm actually going to shift illustrations now. Okay. <laughs> only so many jobs, only, only so many positions, only so many Bitcoins to mine, only so many. And so there's that hungry hippo, just like scarcity, scarcity mentality. But when you know that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, when you know that God, the sovereign God, is working all things together for your good, you can relax a little. You can dial it down and you can trust a little bit. When you know that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and that afterwards He will take you in a glory, you're going to be okay if you miss out. It's amazing. And so Jesus had this understanding, and the reason Jesus made history is because he lived in a time of anxious scarcity, and he lived completely differently than everybody else. So Jesus was connected to the Father. It was the Father's love in him, and then secondly, it was his love for us. His love for us. There was a movie a long time ago, many of you were not born, it was called Wicker Park in the early 2000s, and uh, there's this line, I love this line, love will make you do crazy things. Love will make you do crazy things. How many of you are embarrassed about some of the dumb stuff you've done when you've been in love? Only one honest pastor down the front. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Man, love will make you do crazy things. It's, there's nine distinct crazy symptoms of people who are in love. I don't have time to get into them, but trust me, there's some weird stuff happening out there. Mrs. T, my sweet wife, been married 24 years. I know we don't look that old. Yes. Yeah. Fell in love in the late 1900s. Honestly, it was incredible. <laughs> At a college in Georgia. I'd come from, I bought a house when I was 19. I lived on my own. Had a car, a motorbike, financially independent, grown man. And I come to college and they say, you've got no visa. You can only work on campus. You can make a minimum wage in Georgia in the year 1997, was around the $5 an hour mark. Generous. So you work 40 hours a week, walking behind a lawnmower, not even a ride-on lawnmower. And at the end of the week, I don't know how much I brought home, it was like $168 or something, 40 hours sweating like a dog. It's like, how much money did you take home? And I'm like, well, let me tell you, in the late 1900s, uh, they had these things called phone cards. And what a pho there used to be a time, like, honestly, it's hard to comprehend that I was alive for it. There was a time before cell phones, okay? And you had to buy a long-distance phone card plan. And you had to pay per minute, and it was nasty expensive. And uh, so how much did I make? It's like enough to call my wife as, as necessary, and I was literally skipping meals to make calls. Love will make you do crazy things. I was like, maybe I can get an extra bonus 10 minutes with Mrs. T while we're engaged. Just wild, the level of love. Well, you scale up from college love to the love of the universe, and I don't know what possessed God Almighty to be violently beaten and crucified for your sin and love will make you do crazy things and here is the Bible says here is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and on the cross Jesus became a propitiatory sacrifice for our sin it's amazing love for you has made God do crazy things that's why I think you know Francis Chan's book crazy love that's crazy. it is so that's how Jesus got through it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He hated the thought of you being in hell, so he endured the cross. He didn't want to live in a world 
of injustice and pain and heartache and separation. And so he went to the cross. This is extraordinary. So he is connected to the Father and filled with love. And he loves humanity. He loves you. And this is fueling him to pour out his life. This is amazing. So that, that's how he did it. Love. You cannot love if you have a deficit of love. We have to be people who are loved. So number four, last point of my talk, how, how do we get a commitment to pursue this kind of community in New York? A commitment to pursue this kind of community in New York. Walter Brueggemann says this, the church needs to imagine what our lives can be like if the gospel were true. The church meets to imagine what our lives will be like if the gospel is true. Some of you are like, I don't need church. I was like, no, you need to show up and, be, and sit next to these people. Some of them are sweaty tonight. It's okay. You need to sit next to these people because we have to reimagine that the story New York is telling and the way New York is building community is not the only way that it is possible. That's the importance of gathering weekly to lift your heart up to God and remember His great love and then to receive His great love and distribute His great love. It's forming us into people of love. The church meets to imagine what our lives can be like if the gospel were true. Now, the reason this is important is because the gospel of God's love is going to confront your vision of community and love. All of us are bringing in our wounds and desires and our projections into the church. And sometimes projecting into the church can actually do violence to the church. I'm about to hit you with eight screens of Bonhoeffer quotes, okay? Well, just lean back a little bit, just right now, just be like, okay, let's just drink in a little life together. Now you're like, this is too much, be quiet please, listen, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> he's in a war with Nazi Germany, and he's like, I gotta build a community stronger than Nazi Germany's formation mechanisms. So he gathers a few Christians together in this little place called Finkenwald, and he writes a book called Life Together. Okay? This is what he says about forming this kind of community. Every human wish dream that is injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He who loves his dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter, even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. God hates visionary dreaming. It makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own law, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living approach to all, a reproach to all others in the circle of brethren. He acts as if he is the creator of the Christian community, as if his dream binds men together. When things do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. When his ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash, so he becomes first an accuser of his brethren, then an accuser of God, and finally the despairing accuser of himself. Because God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship, because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ, long before we entered into common life with them, we enter into that common life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. We thank God for what He has done for us. We thank God for giving us brethren who live by His call, by His forgiveness, and by His promise. Now, I can tell you right now, probably if we were stripped of the luxuries of Western culture, and put into a context where it was illegal to defend your faith, most of the problems that you think are a part of your life would disappear. Most of the things you complain about in your church, your relationship, your group, your friendships would all disappear. You would strip away all of the luxury and you would be left with the beauty of brothers and sisters suffering with you. And the challenge you and I have is to voluntarily try and do that in the mammon-filled delusion of Western secular radical individualism. Do you know how hard it is to get people to voluntarily strip away the privilege and the preference for the sake of sacrificial love? That's the task we have at hand. So loving others is about hard discipleship, hard discipleship-driven real-world decisions. 
This means love is not about how you feel when you're singing. And love is not that person oversharing, but you're having an emotional connection with them in your group. Love is about where you choose to work. Love is about how you spend your money. Love is about where you choose to live. Love is about how you reconcile when there's pain. Love is about how long when you stay when you don't get your way. And love is about your willingness to suffer. These are the keys of the Christian community. Do a little bit of a pastoral confession. Um, pastoring during COVID was not fun. I wish everybody had a chance to pastor through the pandemic. It was hard to get through the pandemic. It really was, just for everybody. But, man, we'd, we'd really been seeking God for a move of God in New York City. I mean, we were, we'd, we'd put some, we'd bled. I've been in New York 15 years bleeding, walking through these streets, weeping tears into the concrete, serving people in secret, pouring my life out, doing everything I could. And, it, and there was so much momentum in our church. Any of you guys here for that? You remember that? It's like amazing. It was like actually amazing. There's people weeping in the aisles, and I was like, I literally thought, maybe this is the beginning of the thing we've labored for all these years. And like in a week, it disappeared. <laughs> and uh, so many people left. And, I, and I, I get it, honestly, like, survive. That's the goal of a pandemic is to get through the pandemic to play the next round of being here. No, no judgment, okay? But it was very painful when people that you'd pastored for over a decade, you saw that they'd left New York and were like, I'm loving my new church, which is in a sunny place where COVID doesn't exist apparently. And they have permanent kids' rooms called Wamba World. And it's just the facilities are bigger than the Isle of Manhattan. You know what I mean? It was hard for my heart. And so I definitely had a little bit one of those kind of like, oh Lord. And I just felt God say this to me. Look more closely. Look more closely at what, happened, what is happening. Look more closely. By the grace of God, our church is coming out of COVID in a really strong place. Leadership-wise, financially, attendance, there's a lot of beautiful things on the horizon. How is that happening? If you look a little bit more closely, what many of you who are new don't know is that there's a group of people that have done this. There's a group of people who have chosen where they work, where they spend their money, where they live, how to fight for relationships, how to stay when they don't get their way, and how to suffer. And underneath the beautiful worship, I love this worship, my favorite worship, underneath the Decent teaching, right? Underneath the, the community that's mapped out in the city, there's a core group of people who have said, I will love like Jesus. I will think like Jesus. I will act like Jesus. I will abide with the Father so I can be like Jesus to the people of this church. So many amazing moments. I had, a, I had a board meeting this week. And this is, you know, when you talk through budgets and buildings and policies, you know. That stuff's important. It doesn't matter until there's a crisis and then you're like, why didn't you work on it? It's important, okay? I'm grateful for the folks who serve. But the thing, like, we had this thing, and it's, it's, it's actually a really interesting exercise. And the exercise was, where do you see the church in three to five years? John, if you could just inform us. Like, where do you see the church in three to five years? And I tell you, the thing, I, I got off that call. It had been a super long day. I got off that call, and I was just like, so encouraged. Because the questions were actually about, what sort of disciples are we producing? What sort of love is present? What sort of radical Jesus stuff are we seeing happen in the midst of the world? And it was so encouraging. I thought about some of the people who are on that board, people who have chosen to buy apartments and consciously design the apartments in such a way that people can stay when they're having hard times. I remember getting a tour of some friends of mine who uh, bought an apartment and they had this like bizarre configuration with these sliding walls and doors and all the rest of it. 
And I said, well, why did you design it like this? And they just explained the vision so non-believers can stay here, so apostolic leaders coming through town can have a place. Why does your table look like it's in a night movie? Oh, yes, yeah, so we want to be able to have 40 people at a time and show the hospital, hospitality of Jesus. One friend who could be doing, could be doing uh, uh, things that are a lot easier, but consciously said, can you make sure that my job happens in the most needy, underserved neighborhoods of New York? That's where I want to voluntarily do my job. Could be going in an easier neighborhood. And I just started thinking, I was like, I don't know if people will ever understand all of the decisions that are made like this, but you are literally the recipients in this room of other people's sacrificial love. It was amazing. Look more closely. But I want to say this. For the thing we're called to be a part of, it cannot be the heroic few. It must be a radical minimum standard. It must be all of us. Bonhoeffer again. Only God knows the real state of our fellowship. What may appear weak and trifling to us may be great and glorious to God. The more thankfully we daily receive what is given to us, the more surely and steadily will fellowship increase and grow from day to day as God pleases. What a vision. It doesn't matter what New York thinks about our church. It doesn't matter if the New York Times thinks that evangelicals are kind of wacky and backward. Who cares if God thinks this is precious and glorious? Who cares if our social media, it's good, but who cares if our social media is like, amazing, if God thinks that our love is beautiful. This church will not be built on the sacrifices of a few or the gifts of people in public. It will be built on your personal choice to say, Jesus, connect me to the Father in a fresh way that I may think like Jesus, love like Jesus, and build a community like Jesus. So if you didn't hear me last week, I'd like to invite you again. Join us. Join us. Oh, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that He would call us children of God, and this is what we are. You've been lavished with love to lavish others. And so tonight, I want us to just close by just asking for God to give us the ability to want to love like this. Look, I know some of you have been hurt by the church. I know, that, I know there's nothing more painful than religious pain. There's nothing more disillusioning than religious disillusion. It's, it's horrific. But I'll tell you this. There's nothing more beautiful than Christian love. There's nothing more beautiful than Christian reconciliation. It's amazing. And so maybe for you tonight, what God is saying to you is, you are so grasping to make yourself something in this city. You've got no room to love. I said it before, but for some of you, the problem is not that you're too sinful for God to use you. It's you're too busy for God to use could but you just don't have time for it so maybe you're going to say hey lord i'm going to reorient my schedule i'm going to make room for love maybe for some of you like you're in our church and you just got this little pet agenda that you're driving and you're and you're you're not willing to empty yourself so maybe tonight it's just god saying hey just surrender it all put it all out there maybe you've got unrealistic expectations and you need to forgive people because you've projected onto them or maybe, maybe you're, you're here from another church. You left another church angry at that church. And you need to make it right with those people because if not, you're just going to bring all that anger. You know when you date someone and it's like it ended badly, like super badly. And they're like, I'd like to be with you immediately. Like, hey, I appreciate that. I think you're great. Perhaps, perhaps a little space for healing. A little space for healing. That's the way you break cycles. You sit down, you process, you come to terms with it. You're honest with it. You grieve it out properly. You get to a point of forgiveness and you ask God for grace to move on in love. And so maybe, maybe some of you need to just do something. Like that. I'm not sure, but here's what I want to know. Or here's what I want to say. We, we've got to receive more of the Father's love. We've got to commit to doing this. Stakes are high. The world needs love. God's put us here at this time of history to be those people. So let's ask Him for power to love like Jesus. So let's just bow our hearts and respond right now. Father, we just want to say to you, uh, we say thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for the cross. 
thank you that you have descended in humility to sit at the table of our lives and work on our problems. Thank you. Father, we bring our hearts to you, Lord. Some people are like, I am ready to love. And other people are like, I am terrified of love. Lord, we're just honest with you right now. We just bring our hearts before you and pray. Would you come and meet with us? Holy Spirit, give us fresh capacity, fresh encounter. Father, you said you shall receive power. And so we just receive you right now, Holy Spirit, fresh power to love, power to forgive, power to have mercy, power for reconciliation. Holy Spirit, we just welcome your ministry in our hearts. We invite you to convict us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to heal us, to challenge us. We open our hearts to you, Holy Spirit. Come and minister amongst us. Father, I just want to pray for those who are cynical and they're sort of there with their arms folded and they think they don't need this. Lord, I just pray you would just show them where their heart was wounded. Lord, it is your desire that we live from full hearts. It is your desire that we know how to rejoice and how to weep with other people because our hearts are full. So I just pray healing tonight, Lord, for those who've got cynical hearts. Just pray, remove the callous. Father, I just pray that you would forgive us for putting expectations on people or communities that they never agreed to. We've just projected it on because we had a good idea or a wish dream and we've judged other people. And really what we've done is we've had selfish expectations that we haven't even communicated. We just pray, Lord, would you forgive us for not holding our hearts open in love to serve other people? And Father, we just pray somehow that just like there's followers of Jesus all around the world in persecuted contexts who are not sucked up in preferences and schedules and, and you know, the dizzying array of enjoyable options in Western culture, and they're just loving fiercely out of loyalty to you. Lord, would you do the miracle in our midst and give us that kind of love, but give it to, in a, give it to us in a place of comfort. Here in this, this part of the world, help us to choose to love deeply. So we thank you for your word tonight. We hear it, and as best we can, we open our hearts and we say, we receive it in a good soil, in Jesus' name, amen. Folks, we've got a, we've got a prayer team here, and uh, if God's spoken to your heart tonight, and uh, you just want to sort of seal that word, maybe you kind of feel stuck, like I want to love, but this, this, I got a blockage, or I got some bitterness, or I need to forgive, so there's something in you, and you'd love to just pray with someone, these people are loving people. Like the highlight of their week is to pray for you and minister to you. So if the Holy Spirit's spoken to your heart at all, there's anything at all, maybe you're going into a hard week that's gonna require extra power to love, difficult conversation, challenging environment, and you just need a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. I wanna encourage you. They'd love to be able to pray for you. So let's stand to our feet. We're gonna close with a song of worship. And if you felt the Spirit prompting you, please.